Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. In today's video, we're discussing how we can develop ourselves, how we can develop our mental processes to the max, how we can max out our intuition, our sensing, our thinking, and our feeling. But first of all, I'm announcing a contest. At the moment, a majority of my Patreons are ENFPs. That makes them the kings of my Patreon page. At the moment, ENFPs make out the majority of my pledges on Patreon. And that makes them the kings of my Patreon page. And if they are the kings of my Patreon page by the end of next week, then I will dedicate a special video to them. But really, it doesn't matter how big your contribution is, I just want to make sure we add each other to our networks and that we spread good ideas and that we help out building this channel, building new content, building the next generation of typology. And okay, maybe I need you all to help support my big caffeine addiction. Seriously, guys, I'm running out of coffee. Okay, time to get back on track. Perhaps some of you remember the rising star of a few years ago, Dave Superpowers, who sadly vanished and I haven't heard about him ever since. But he made some interesting, really interesting infographs. In making these graphs, he set a bar for how much an INTJ uses introverted intuition, extroverted thinking, introverted feeling, and extroverted sense. And this all played a part in a change in MTI, a change where we all started kind of counting how often a person used their cognitive functions. If we saw a lot of one cognitive function, that often led us to assume that they were a certain personality type. Now, there are issues here. For example, extroverted functions tend to be much more visible than introverted functions. And that function use tends to vary from day to day, and that sometimes we show unusually high use of certain inferior functions. And I believe that we've come a long way since the days of Dave's superpowers. We've stopped counting cognitive function usage and we've begun to finally understand how each cognitive function, how each mental process impacts a person's personal health and well-being. But what we all learn when we start thinking about it is our cognitive functions are constantly dynamic. They are shifting, growing, changing. We are developing ourselves, we are developing our different functions and learning how to use them in different ways. And so, much thanks to the works of John Beebe, we have been able to realize that it's not about how much you use a cognitive function, but it's about how and for what purpose you use it. What John Beebe began to do was list our personality traits, list our different processes based on what archetype they correlated to. There was the hero, there was the good parent, there was the innocent child, and there was the anima or animus. Now, I think that Beebe's work was difficult to translate into a practical reality. It took quite some time before people started to finally understand how to use these concepts, these archetypes, to understand the different cognitive functions. Perhaps thanks to that, projects like Personality Hacker were able to give the different functions different properties, describing the first or the dominant processes of our minds as the drivers, describing our supporting habits as the co-pilot, describing our tertiary habits as the childish habits, and finally the worst habits, our weaknesses and how we are at our worst as the three-year-old. And what we can basically begin to do today is we can start understanding how each cognitive function affects a personality type's health. We can say, hey, this is healthy behavior for an INTJ, this is growth behavior for an INTJ, this is childish behavior for an INTJ, and this is stress and anxiety behavior for an INTJ. And this is different because that means that an INTJ is just not a weak ESFP. They don't have 30% extroverted sensing. They have a very unique way of using and tapping into extroverted sensing that basically changes the whole emotional state and emotional expression of the state in itself. But there is another really good thing about this shift in the debate, and it is that we have stopped looking at INTJs as the masterminds. We are starting to realize that type and ability are two separate dimensions that 
type is something you are in when a healthy state but ability this is something you can develop learn something you can get and acquire throughout your years throughout your life the fascinating thing i've learned when studying intelligent children is that intelligent children highly intelligent children tend to outcompete people of all personality types in all domains and while later in their years they may, may become specialized like a lot of us do it's generally the case that a smart, a really intelligent ENFP will outcompete a dumb or less intelligent ISTJ, while a smart ISTJ will outcompete an ENFP, a dumb ENFP. And the smart ISTJ that has gotten the skills necessary in school and in their life will show a smarter creativity than the average ENFP. The ISTJ won't have flow state creativity. But even if they do, the ISTJ won't have creativity as a flow state. Rather, for the ISTJ, the ENFP states and intelligences are associated with stress and anxiety. And it is usually stress and anxiety that can drive an ISTJ to become highly creative. And if you don't realize that, you might easily look at this ISTJ and you think, oh, he must be too creative to be an ISTJ. And it is ever so often when you look at an ENFP under stress, under anxiety, that you start to see all the stressors, what the stressors bring out in the ENFP. You start to notice how they become a lot more rigid. You start to notice how organized they become. Suddenly everything is about being on time, everything is about following schedules. And they tense up so noticeably because this is not something they do for fun. It, this is an ENFP in serious mode. This is an ENFP in work mode. An ENFP that has told themselves to get their act together and to push, push themselves to the limit. And what determines how successful the ENFP will be in this process really comes down to their aptitude, to their intelligence and to their personal development. With intelligence, what we know is that intelligent people tend to learn faster. They accumulate information more quickly. But if they don't get the support in school and if they don't get the appropriate amounts of stimulation, they, their intelligence might stagnate. And this is often why people with high intelligence don't necessarily become a lot more successful later on in their years in society. We might feel inclined to call them lazy and maybe that's accurate, but often laziness is the result of lack of stimulation. The less stimulated we become, the less able we become to handling stress and to handling challenge. And the less able we are to deal with challenge and obstacles, the less likely we are to succeed and learn and to master the skills necessary to succeed and thrive in our life. The brain is smart. It won't develop the ability to do high-level physics if it isn't challenged or stimulated to do so. Ever so often, the brain wants to have fun. And the reason for that is why we need our tertiary function. I would say that the tertiary function plays a key role in learning and in progress and in responding to challenges. When we're using the tertiary or the child function, what we're doing is we are engaging in something that fills us with a sense of fun and joy and stimulation. But when we're using the auxiliary, which is said to be the key to growth, that is when we respond to our higher awareness, when we do what we know is right, when we do something important, when we work towards an important goal in our life. And so we have these different states. We have the sidekick or the child state associated with the tertiary, or we have the auxiliary state or the mentor or the parent state associated with our higher awareness, our sense of duty, our sense of right and wrong. And I think that often we tend to associate becoming more responsible with going into the second function. You could see it as graduating from the student mindset or the sidekick mindset you had and used in school to becoming a parent, a responsible figure, a mentor, someone who is helping pick other people up, someone who is contributing to society in some way or form. But personally, I would say it's all about the driver, it's all about you, it's all about where you want to go next. I would argue that there is even a point to the inferior, there is even a point to the rival. We need it in terms of stress and in terms of crisis and when dealing with trauma. If an INFJ is faced with a lot of stress, I would argue them to go towards sensing and perceiving or to find a healthy way of expressing it, because often the influence can be negative, but if you go towards martial arts or towards uh, cooking or like some area that 
truly relies on a healthy use of extroverted sensing that can help relieve some of the stress associated with using this function. What you need to be aware of is basically the unhealthy habits of these different states, the unhealthy tendencies of both the child, of the parent, and of the inferior, of the baby. And ideally, when developing your cognitive functions, you need to be smart about how you develop them. And really, when you are developing your cognitive functions, you need to be smart about how you develop them. Something people forget, for example, is that willpower is a finite resource. There is only a set amount of things that we can resist or restrain ourselves towards. We have a set amount of discipline or a set amount of energy that we can put into taxing, energy taxing activities for our personality type. And people who have more taxing activities than they have rewarding activities will find themselves feeling drained, overwhelmed and stressed to the max. So often what I can recommend people to do is plan ahead. Set reasonable challenges for yourself based on things that are a little beyond your level but not so far beyond that you find it unreachable. Ever so often what we resist in ourselves persists. Persists as a permanent stressor, a permanent negative thought that we keep coming back to. Ever so often, the child represents fears we have, things we worry about, things that can sometimes uh, feel overwhelming or overstimulating. Ever so often, the parent functions forget about what we need to be happy. They are so filled with that sense of duty or honoring obligation or living up to commitment that they forget about their passion or what made them happy. Ever so often, the child can bring up that sense of positive, sense of humor that we need to survive through life's difficulty. Ever so often, the parent gives us that sense of motivation and tells us what we know is important, what we know is right, what we know needs to be done. Being in the grip of either of these two influences and pushing the other way is not going to lead to emotional growth or to thriving. And every so often the baby, the three-year-old, the inferior, the rival shows us what we are feeling, what we're struggling with, what our anxieties are, what our worries are, what our stressors are. And they can, in showing us, help paint the way, help us set sustainable ways of being. Anyways, that is all for today, and I hope that I will see you guys on Patreon, where we can start finally building some good community together. I have to tell you guys, I was at the meetup just yesterday, and it was so much fun to start connecting with others, to start sharing ideas with others, to start learning together with other people. Truth be told, I need a Patreon page, because it's through all of your questions that I get all my ideas. You keep putting so brilliant questions in my way. You keep challenging me to be good, to make good content, and that means my quality improves. And I don't want that Patreon page to be an empty charity. I want to give people something back for everything they put in. Exclusive material, books, articles, and the chance to get free typing consultations. It's a service. All of it. It's a service. It's, some, uh, it's a way for you to get something and for me to get something. And I do want to tell you guys that my ambition is always that my content will at some point be free and available for everyone. If it can help you, I want you to have it. I can only charge for an early sneak peek or for the chance to get special service. I don't want to do anything to lock my regular followers out. I want to have fun, I want to learn, I want to keep making good videos. I want to publish books, I want to go to meetups, I want to interact with all of you. And I want to make a real big serious contribution to the world of typology and psychology. And to some point I'm ready to accept that lone wolf as I am, I can't change the world on my own. So for anyone who wants to, come join me on my Patreon page or send me a good message on YouTube. I always enjoy all feedback I can get.